Gnosticism is both a specific ancient heresy that the church already faced and defeated, but that it is also the essence of the revival of religious paganism, which has the goal of creating a new pagan planetary civilization where the Christian message will be snuffed out if they can do it. That's threatening the church, and that's not new. We are living in a time, we are told, of pagan apocalypse, a time of unveiling where this so-called esoteric knowledge is coming out onto the surface and is being made available for everybody. Nobody is embarrassed anymore to call themselves esoteric or even occult. This has become normal spirituality. For instance, the Jewish Kabbalah used to be reserved only for the mature. Now it's being broadcast all over. The New Age people speak of the dawning of the age of Aquarius. The radical witches and feminists speak of the Sophianic millennium, the second coming of the goddess. The spiritual homosexuals predict the coming of eschatological Sodom. The Masons are going public. In other words, what M Masonic thinking really wants to say now is being said clearly, and I found it very clearly said in Dan Brown's latest book, The Lost Symbol, where you find at the end of the book that the symbol that's discovered is the fact, quote, that the ancient mysteries, that is Gnosticism, and the Bible are the same. You see that? There's an attempt to bring all religions together under the rubric of these mystery religions, namely, of course, Gnosticism. Others see the Mayan calendar as decisive for our future. The Christian emergence speak of a deep shift or the great emergence. Apocalyptic Buddhists speak of the coming of Maitreya. Carl Jung, the great Gnostic, had a book, it's called the Red Book, and it shows very clearly the paranormal, occultic, shamanistic character of Jungian psychology. But the most telling, it seems to me, of all these movements now up on the surface is what's called the perennial philosophy. It's believed that this perennial philosophy, this, that is to say this philosophy that's always been there, is at the very core of all religions. That there is a deep level of, of agreement between all the religions, and that it is a subterranean stream that is now appearing on the surface. And what is interesting is that the Gnostic Bishop of Los Angeles says that the perennial philosophy is another term for Gnosticism, ancient and modern. So very subtly you see, ancient Gnosticism is back with us as this underground stream of eternal, endless truth about religion. Well, what does this perennial or Gnostic philosophy say? What's its good news? Well, the good news is, first of all, the good news about God. God is the father of the totalities. That is, he is the all. And God joins the opposites. So what is Gnosticism? It is, I believe, a Christianized or Judaized form of paganism that's always been with us, the one great perennial philosophy. And I bring for proof the statement of 
an English witch. Caitlin Matthews is a priestess of Isis. And she says this, Gnosticism serves most admirably as a bridge for paganism to infiltrate Christianity in our time. And she's the one who announces the second coming of the goddess, the Sophianic millennium, the era of the goddess, where all peoples and all faiths will be united together. And of course, at that moment, Yahweh must be silent. The two great Gnostic scholars, Hans Jonas and Kurt Rudolph, never saw Gnosticism as Christian. Rudolph says that Gnosticism is an independent world religion and not, should not be narrowly limited to a Christian heresy. It was a parasite, he said, prospering on the soil of the Christian religion. So that's a very quick background of what is Gnosticism. It is a very serious, ancient, and now modern view, spiritual view of existence. The question is, what's its future? And I've already intimated to you that I think that it has its eye on a planetary civilization. We didn't realize this in the 60s when the hippies were looking for personal mystical enlightenment. But that has become much more than a footnote. We have seen during this period the demise of secularism which has not survived the bringing together of the East and the West. And that this change of joining the East and the West, of Eastern mysticism and Western technology is really the essence of our world today. But there are some in the vanguard of this new vision of the world, this progressive, cutting edge, new thinking that have said things about the future. Lloyd Gearing, an apostate Presbyterian, yes, we do have some, argues that tomorrow's culture will be post-Christian. And he says this, the time for glorifying the almighty God who supposedly rules is now over. And he predicts that sometime in the future, the calendar will be renamed and the year 2000 will be rechristened as the year 1 GE, global era. The Lord's Supper will be only significant, a significant human fellowship and Christmas will be a family holiday. He says, tomorrow's culture will be religiously pagan. Mother Earth will be the consciously chosen symbol referring to everything about the Earth's ecosystem. He says then, that the loving care of Mother Earth is in many quarters replacing the former sense of obedience to the Heavenly Father. So, wow. So those were just a few brief excerpts from a presentation on the Gnostic Gospel by uh, Peter Jones, uh, which is just fantastic. One of the most intriguing things I've listened to in, in quite some time. So, um, special thanks to the channel Daylight Riders who recently um, brought that to my attention. Um, I'll leave a link to his channel and to the the full lecture, which I highly encourage everyone to go check out. Um, I wish I could play the whole thing, but I did want to just touch on a few of the points that really stuck out to me, and specifically this this part at the end. Um, he just does a really good job of talking about Gnosticism as being obviously basically the embodiment of the ancient mystery schools, the you know mystery Babylon, um, going all the way back. Uh, we would even look at it as going back to the antediluvian area with the fallen angels themselves. Just lots of great stuff in there. But this part at the end where he talks about uh, Mother Earth and the, or the goddess. Uh, basically replacing God the Father and being this essential element, this this chosen symbol of Gnosticism itself just really blew me away when I listened to that. And just kind of tied into some things that I've, I've been thinking about over the past, you know, many months. Um, 
obviously coming back to cosmology and just reflecting upon these questions, the you know, the theological questions and the philosophical questions behind you know, why, why create a, a false uh, cosmology? Why, why create Copernicanism? And what you know, what is the the satanic agenda behind all that? And just like so many other things, we can you know, when we look into, there isn't necessarily just one one reason. There's usually many reasons and many many layers and levels to it and that they make as much use out of a given thing as possible. So obviously we can look at the motives of a Copernican universe in terms of its ties to evolution and in terms of its ties to the UFO deception or uh, threats from space. All these things we've been talking about. But when you really kind of step back and just t take a very big picture look at it all, especially through the lens of Gnosticism and as uh, Peter Jones talks about how Gnosticism and Christianity can be distinguished quite simply through the difference between monism versus dualism. This is what uh, things like uh, Kabbalah and other Gnostic traditions mean when they talk about emanations, right? That we're not actually separate creations of, a, of an eternal God, but we're just emanations of God. That we're just that the universe itself is God and it's always creating. It's, it's so it's a complete denial of what the Bible says about God being separate and distinct from his creation, right? So when we stop and think about all of that, and you go back and look at, call it the Flat Earth model, call it ancient Hebrew cosmology, whatever, and you just really think about that, this whole concept of, of dualism versus monism, right? And then kind of consider that ancient cosmology is really actually sort of embodying the idea of God being separate and distinct from the creation. Right? We're, we're all on our own level, all on our own plane, and God is above in a, in a literal sense. And I think to a lot of people that, even, you know, the vast majority of Christians, this initially sounds extremely childish to us. It, it seems like it's just way over simplistic and, and silly and you know but I think that's the more I've thought about this the more I really think this is kind of the way we've been taught to think but honestly it, it does make sense when you think about just everything in our in our day-to-day -day human experience um, you know God didn't have to create create it in such that we live that we walked around on on a ground and had a sky above us but yet our entire uh, experience of the world, the way we perceive it, the way we we contemplate it, is through the the framework of up and down, of things being right side up or upside down. And so, what the globe essentially does is is take that objective framework of there being a an objective absolute up, and and an objective absolute down, and makes them completely you know makes them completely relative and almost meaningless. So if we think of those as being sort of, you know, the, when we think about the philosophical and theological outworkings of that, it absolutely ties into the idea of, of Mother Earth and, and globe, a globe Mother Earth versus, could you really create the same Mother Earth Gaia teaching out of the, the, the ancient cosmology, right? Where there's a, a roof and there's an edge and there's a, a firmament I don't really see I don't really think you could on a globe mother earth is is the lifeboat you know it's spaceship earth it's it's the thing that's keeping us alive in this crazy dark cold dangerous vacuum of space and so it ties into the the whole teaching of, of Gaia and the goddess and worshiping the creation and being connected to the creation and all the all the the NASA propaganda and environmentalism, and, you know, and the environmentalist movement, and all these things that constantly tie together. And I, you know, people might think I'm reaching here, but I do definitely see it all tying tying back to the cosmology piece again. And when we remember that um, the globe and the concept of planets as being, you know, planetary spheres and all these things, you know, those cosmological ideas did not originate with the authors of the Bible, from the patriarchs of the Bible, but they originated with the, the Gnostics of, of places like Greece and the mystery schools.